So, Mario, yep. just tell us a bit about um, your background and how you got here. Uh, well, my name is Mario, Mario Fajardo. I'm from uh, Chile originally. I, uh, I was born in the city, so I'm a, you can say, a city boy and not a farmer. That's a very important thing to say. Um, but I do come from a, from a soil science background. My dad was a soil science and soil scientist. Uh, he did. He's a, he's an old school soil scientist. He did. A, he did a master in Belgium where you have the um, the old school soil science uh, branch of uh, pedologists, if you if you want to say. It's basically a branch of like geologists. So like they basically go there and dig holes and like they they're really in touch with the soil. Uh, by seeing him. I decided to, it was, it was a nice uh, thing to do for life. Uh, you're always in contact with, uh, with the land, you're in contact with the people, so I said, all right, I'm just going to study that thing. Sadly, in Chile and in many other countries, you don't have the soil science degree, so the closest thing was agronomy. It was the most natural thing. Uh, and then I joined the University of Chile, in, uh, in Chile. Uh, and I did study, I did my degree, and in Chile we have a, a very particular long degree, it's a six years degree, so it's something like a master, you, and then you study all the different aspects of agronomy. We go broadacre, we go uh, vineyards, we study a bit of physiology, uh, we do like agroclimb, um, soil science of course, my water management, fisheries, poultry, etc. So you, do, you have a, a big idea what is the what is agriculture, and what, are, what are all the different components of agriculture working together as a whole. Uh, and it has also a thesis component, so it, it's a very, very long degree. And, um, and then I joined, uh, well, as a, as, a, as a normal, I, I wasn't thinking about the living in Chile, to be honest. Uh, I never thought that I would end up here in Australia. Um, and I, I just decided to work in a, in a fertilizers company that was selling fertilizers and my specialty was soil science uh, and I, I knew about how plants work in the soil and, uh, and I knew about all the cycles that they, uh, they are in, in nature pretty much uh, so I used all the skills that I had in soil science to apply this thing to basically sell a product which was uh, organic amendments and we did a lot of work, uh, and then suddenly I, I start finding out that there's so much to research in this area. There's, uh, there's so many things that are still, they still have great potential in improving. Uh, and then I thought, well, I need to learn more. Uh, so I applied to a scholarship, I won the scholarship, and they literally told me, you can go whenever you want to go in the world. I said, well, Sydney is very close to the beach. It's, uh, <laughs> it has a nice weather, that's important. And it has a, it has a long tradition in, uh, in, in, uh, in agriculture and in broad acre agriculture. And that, well, that's, that's, a, that's the main thing, that broad acre agriculture depends and relies on the cycles of nature. It's Highly it's not like, for example, um, these uh, greenhouses experiments where everything's controlled. In broad acre, nothing's controlled. And we need to understand how the different cycles of Earth are working. When the rain is coming, how to store the moisture in the soil, etc. The timings, the cycles. So I said, all right, I'm just going to come here. And I came here and I found out that in here, the precision ag world was highly more, like it was much more advanced than in Chile. Like in Chile I was pretty much digging holes and I was describing the soil profile and I was using the tools that the old, old school soil scientists were using. Just a shovel and a Munsell color table. And your understanding of how the environment works. Uh, but in Yi they were using computers, uh, they were using programming tools, they were using a spectrometer that I didn't know 
what it was. And basically a spectrometer is what, is what astronomers use. It's basically understanding how light impacts or reflects in matter. And uh, by doing that, you take information out of what is reflecting. Um, that in very general terms, of course. Uh, so I started my thesis as a PhD student here in Sydney, in the University of Sydney, in 2011. And I did my PhD basically in applying different tools of spectroscopy in describing soil. If we uh, want to, to relate how the environment, how the different cycles of nature impact in, for example, wheat yield or, for example, in any kind of uh, plant uh, behavior, we need to understand that uh, the first thing that they have in contact with is the soil. And the soil is not just a piece of stone. It's not, let's say, geologists. They study how the formation of the different rocks and the different layers of, uh, of uh, the ground they behave or they, they are like uh, organized. A soil scientist will understand, will describe the soil as a living being. And uh, the living part of soil, of course, is the, micro, the microbial part of the soil. And, uh, and that is pretty much a whole society of, uh, of life. So uh, we did a study in, um, this, was, this was one of the chapters of the thesis. Um, and we did a study with a soil microbiologist in here, not me, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a soil scientist as a whole. Uh, and we went to, in, um, all across New South Wales, we did two transits going from the boundary with uh, Victoria to the boundary with Queensland, and then from Coffs Harbour, the big banana of Coffs Harbour, <laughs> to Wanarin. Is a, is a little town, 200 k's west Burke. So it's pretty much in the middle of nowhere. And we took samples every 50 kilometers. So that we basically covered like a big extension wow. of, uh, of land. How many soil cores in total? Uh, a lot. There were, no, not much. There were like 100 and something because they were like well, well um, apart. And did you stratify this in we, what steps? We described the entire soil core. So we describe it with spectroscopy tools, we describe it with wet chemistry, so the classic NPK and etc. Uh, soil aggregate stability, I develop a method for soil aggregate stability that now is an app. That, well, I'm, I'm a bit of a programmer here, that all those things I, they will learn in here. Like I, as I told before, I didn't know any kind of programming and I don't have an engineering background, I just, I do have an understanding how soil and how nature works and how the cycles, uh, they work in, in, uh, in, in space and in time, but I do not, well, I didn't know, uh, I didn't have a, a programming background, so I like all those things that I learned in India. Anyway, so we um, extracted the DNA from the soil, so pretty much like putting the soil in a blender, and we took all the different uh, little parts of DNA that there were in, uh, in the, and we sequenced them. And it's basically recognizing and identifying all the different kinds of bacteria, all the different kinds of fungi. We're talking about millions, literally in the millions, um, different types of, uh, of uh, microbes. Then, since I, I, I got knowledge from spectroscopy, and the, the data of spectroscopy and the data of microbes, they're very, very similar. So they're pretty much like matrices of like hundreds and hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of different attributes of the soil. So in spectroscopy, we analyze light. In microbiology, we analyze DNA sequences. But the shape of the data is pretty much the same thing. Since I had uh, a deep knowledge in spectroscopy, because I, I, I was doing my thesis in, in that, we analyzed the diversity of different microbes in the soil. And by doing that, and uh, we analyzed how diverse, were, how, how, how rich was the soil in terms of life across the different environments in uh, New South Wales. And uh, we actually found out some 
very, very interesting results. So um, uh, we learned that microbes are not randomly located. They have, a, they have a deep relation with the type of soil that you have. And of course, the, type of, the, the types of soils, they will have a different potential for hosting life. So not just microbes, but life in general. The, microbes, the more the microbes, the more diverse is the soil, the cycles of nutrients are, more, are faster, and they have, let's say, in terms of plant physiology, they will have a, more, a higher potential to have, for example, a higher yield of uh, any kind of uh, plant. Yeah. So, so it's the parent material that's driving the micro, microbiology that's occurring in the soil? It's not just the parent material? Not just. We found out, well, the, the main studies of uh, soil microbiology, they're made by ecologists and my, microbiologists, not by soil scientists. Yeah, not not by agronomist. That's the that's a key part of, of the study that we did in um, in the, well the study that just was published like was published two weeks ago. The name is Understanding Soil Microbial Communities with Two Giant Transects in New South Wales, and it's not just um, it's not just controlled by the parent material, but the parent material, the climate the kinds of plants that you have, the, the organisms, the... Um, do, 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 do. So that's the feedstock that'll determine what microbes... It's everything. Grow. It's a yeah. whole environment there. So, so the pH, complex. the temperature, it's, highly, it's a highly complex system that will um, determine the kind of population on the kind of uh, microbe, microbial activity that you will have there. And it's highly linked with the soil type. It's highly linked with the soil type. And that's what, well, of course, for a soil scientist and for like someone that, that knows about land, for a farmer, the farmer will know that, like, I don't know, black country will have these properties and will have this potential of hosting or of like planting something, of, of uh, let's say I'm going to put some yield there, or there, some wheat there, or I'm going to put some cotton or whatever, because they have an idea of what that piece of land can uh, can hold, the potential of it. Yeah. Uh, the but yeah, potential, the classification of land. Exactly. Correct. So the classification of land it has it has high high um, a high relation with with the with the soil microbiology. Do you feel there's actually a way that we could actually leverage the research you've done, I should say, better into actually something that a farmer could, say, put in the ground or put on fertiliser or seed coating to actually get a yield? Yeah, basically using the information that we have mm. to make decisions. Um, so or is it too far, early? Yeah, yeah, to use it, basically, to uh, some management. Um, so far... The understanding of how microbes were distributed, it uh, has been a bit biased by the by the ecologists, pretty much. They they say, all right, so we have more more microbes towards the equator because it's controlled by temperature, um, and some of the theories. I think in order to use this information, um, I. Th Think well. We did some. Since we know what are the factors that are controlling microbes, and since in here in Sydney Uni we we're working a lot with maps, and we know a bit of modeling, uh, digital soil mapping, pretty much. So we apply this knowledge, and we did some maps of uh, of microbes of soil microbiology. I actually recently wrote a, like a chapter of a book, like talking about like soil diversity and. It's highly related with soil microbiology. So as soon as you have a map, as, as soon as you have a visual representation of how the microbiology is in space, then immediately you can take some decisions. You can say, all right, this piece of land maybe is not, is not highly suitable for this kind of crop because you won't have the potential to, to have plants there. So in terms of zone delineation for example it's uh it's yeah it's like we can we can basically make decisions 
where to use the land, or like which places to use based on the on the life that it hosts. It's a microbiology, and it's a uh, it's it's a thing that that's a unique of uh, of uh, precision agriculture. I mean, it's um, is that we are using tools that astronomers, physicists, engineers, and many others are using, but for actually using the land. And that's the that's the, I think that's a that's a main issue of uh, of having this well the need that society has for not not just precision agriculture but to and to have a, a deep understanding of of the land and also to have these highly advanced sometimes tools that are just um, they're just used for theoric science, theoretical science. So yeah, so by using spectroscopy, by using DNA sequencing, by using um, mapping uh, uh, knowledge, we can actually deliver a product that can be used by a farmer that doesn't, doesn't have like full understanding of all this, uh, yeah. this, uh, this technology. Better add value to the farm. And that's a great segue into talking about the tools that you're using. Can you tell us about the soil spectroscopy work that you've been doing? Yeah. Difficult to explain what spectroscopy is, but uh, I think a, an analogy would be the human eye, for example. What we can see, it's what we have in our, in our eyes, it's basically a spectrometer. It's just that. A spectrometer that can go that can detect light in the visible part of the spectrum. That's why we call it the visible part of the spectrum, because we have eyes. And the visible part of the spectra is in the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have the UV light that we can't see. Then you have like a, the infrared that we can't see. Maybe Predator from the movie can't see like <laughs> the infrared. And we actually have like some, some technologies that can filter the light so we can actually see the infrared. Uh, then you have the x-rays, then you have some of the parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Humans can see just from 390 more or less nanometers of frequency of light till about 700 nanometers. So that's a tiny fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then, for example, if you see um, the green color of uh, leaves, that's because the green part of the light, that's a, that's a region of the electromagnetic spectrum, the green color reflects on that matter and we are able to see. So we're identifying properties of that matter. So that particular piece of leaf uh, will absorb all the other parts of the spectra and will reflect the green. So that's an attribute, okay? So spectroscopy, the, the kind of spectroscopy that we're using in here, it goes a bit further in the electromagnetic spectrum. So not just checking the visible part of the spectrum, but some other parts of the spectrum. The near-infrared, the red edge, far red, etc. So we're going from 350 nanometers to 2500 nanometers. So it's basically having an eye that can see where our eyes can't. So that's that's the, that's a, that's a, that's an important part of spectroscopy, and well, the spectroscopy line of research started in around the '60s, and it's basically uh, together with the, um, the the first computers. And why? Because we didn't have the technology to analyze these sets of data. Okay. So as soon as we had a computer that was able to analyze this kind of data, immediately the technology was it started. It has it started to has an, had an application. Okay, so how do we use soil spectros well spectroscopy in general? It's basically identifying things that we can't see. So for example, a wheat seeker. It's a that's a that's a sensor that it's like it's very common in agriculture. The wheat seeker basically. Uh, detects some regions of uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum that uh, we can't see. So it's the, the near infrared, for example, and it will say, "All right, we have this kind of uh, well, some weeds they reflect, especially 
you can identify some widths by their signature reflectance in the near infrared spectrum. Or, for example, uh, we can, for example, predict the pH of the soil just by pointing with a spectrometer. Of course, pointing with a spectrometer, getting the signal out, applying a series of algorithms that is, it's 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 basically modeling, a multivariate model, um, modeling the. the the pH with the, with this signature of the spectrum. So, by using spectroscopy, we can have a cheap information with of several several attributes of the matter: um, pH, clay content, uh, cation exchange capacity, carbon, nitrogen, etc., etc. So, I think yeah, spectroscopy is basically super high, something like that. Yeah. So you said it's a multi-form of um, modelling and all the rest of it. Yeah. As an endpoint user and as farmer, yeah. I'm very excited about it because effectively having a soil test in your pocket, I mean, it's exactly. way more complicated than that. Yeah. But how accurate is a soil spectroscopy result, say for pH or any other parameter that you'd like to talk about, yeah. compared to the traditional... Um, wet methods and all that type of yeah. stuff that the labs use. Yeah. Um, for different properties, it has a different performance. Uh, Ed, as I call it mine, he, he, will, he will talk a bit more about the performance of, uh, of the NII. His, his uh, work has been basically applying these tools uh, in real life. Um, the performance in terms of uh, in nitrogen, for example, there's a, this, this this big myth that we can actually predict uh, soluble uh, nitrogen, available nitrogen in soils. All these companies, they're like, oh yeah, yeah so we can easily go there with a spectrometer, predict all this nitrogen. Uh, I would doubt about the the quality of that data, and mainly because nitrogen is highly soluble. And, uh, and studies have shown that, um, that the signature that the light lifts of soil can't predict much the nitrogen, the nitrate groups. So yeah, the performance varies on the attribute. Uh, middle infrared technologies, uh, technologies, for example, is a different kind of spectrometer. They are highly accurate in predicting um, particle size. So there's some labs actually that they're using the technology. They have big data sets with like highly variable data sets of different soil types. And uh, with using middle infrared spectrometry, the spectroscopy, they can predict around 90%, 90 something percent of accuracy. So, so yeah, like compared with wet technology, it, that it also, well, wet uh, chemistry that, it, that also has, of course, like a, an error, like a human error. Um, they're comparable, absolutely comparable. So they, they can replace the wet chemistry in some other properties. They, they just can't. Yeah. And uh, well, that, that that's some of the studies that we're actually doing now, like um, it, it, trying to get some other parts of the light that may may have uh, some extra information. Uh, we're doing some studies in here using UV light. Um, that well, it has a it's a high part, it's a high frequency part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and um, trying to predict uh, nitrates. That that's it's a highly valuable product that uh, that we we all need actually. Uh, there's some other technologies, X uh, X rays, for example. We we have here in the uni an X ray spectrometer as well, uh, that is mainly used for detecting heavy metals. Um, and it's highly accurate, so compared with the wet chemistry, it's it's, it's one to one, very much. So it's a it's a cheap, uh, it's well cheap, relatively cheap, because of course the instrument is, is expensive. But as soon as you have the instrument, you have like hundreds and thousands of observations, like in a matter of seconds. So one of the things is we want to try and get more smart people like yourself to consider agriculture as a career. Like, we need to drag the data sciences, the engineers, everyone else to start considering agriculture as a potential. Physicists, as you just, that hadn't even popped up on my radar before. Yeah. How do you feel, or what, how do you feel we can get those people to be involved 
and also to uh, what is the benefit that you've found from coming into the agriculture? Like, I mean, you've talked about how you're actually in contact where your food's come from, the soil, you're outside, it's a really interesting field. But what, what are the benefits that you could describe to a young person at university or at school considering where they need to take the next step in their career? Yeah. Well, there's a point in, um, in the kind of data that we, we are handling in, in, uh, in agriculture in general and more specifically in precision agriculture where, where, we, have, where we are dealing with in ki this kind of information that requires a deeper, deeper understanding of first the source, the theory behind the, um, the, the acquiring that information. For example, spectroscopy. Uh, that requires a deeper understanding of how this thing works. So an, agronomy, an agronomist will understand the, the useful part of the information, but for example, an engineer will understand how you got that information and how you can get it better or faster. So, or for example, this um, in the informatics uh, area, uh, now we're working in, uh, with satellite imagery, which is basically a kind of spectroscopy, uh, because we have like hyperspectral uh, images. Uh, they have, again, different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, but this time in a, in a raster. Um, and as soon as we use using this information, we, we are talking about big volumes of, of data by, in the terabytes. So using this information requires programming skills, requires uh, an understanding of uh, multivariate modeling, a deep understanding of mathematics. Those skills that are the only engineers, physicists, and like hard, hardcore coders will know, uh, they have. So we need, basically, we need engineers in this thing. But we need engineers that actually understand why they're doing this thing. So it, I, I'll put you an example. We have we are now working with uh, with engineers, with an engineer and one data analyst, and uh, and the funny thing is, they are sometimes uh, applying these methods, Bayesian networks or some kind of like uh, convolutional neural networks modeling, and uh, but they even even though they have a deep understanding of the maths behind. They don't know why why they're using the maths. So again, we need something in between. We need we need people that that links this thing. We certainly need engineers, but I don't know. Like we need we need applied engineers, and that's we need engineers that only work for precision ag or for agriculture. So like a, 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 an area in between. And, and I think that's a big problem, in, not just in Australia, but in the world. We are closing the faculties of agriculture. That's, that's, a, that's a common topic. It's not just here in Australia. And why? Because agriculture, as a concept, it's seen as an old thing. But the thing is, the data that we have here, it's unique. Like we, we are the only ones that are using satellite imagery for actually predicting how plants are behaving the only area that is doing that thing, not ecologists, not microbiologists, not like uh, physicists, not astronomers, not like people that work with climate, etc. The, the kind of data that we have in agriculture, it's so big that we actually need high-tech agricultures now. And we're in need of it. And uh, But the problem is, yeah, we're like trying to communicate with the engineers and they don't have the knowledge. So I think we need degrees. We need more degrees in applying this set of technologies in agriculture. I'm experiencing this problem. I've been working in the area for the last 15, 20 years. And, and I'm, I'm still struggling understanding the maths that are behind. So I, I, it would be great like if, if, for example, in my undergrad, I would study a bit of programming. A bit of uh, a bit of engineering, a bit of like s some high level maths.
you see that, that the data that we that we holding that the tractors, the, the, the tractors they they have like sensors of like fuel, uh, they have all, all, of course with like a GPS location, they have they have different sensors and we're we're sadly we have a lot of data and we need people to analyze that data. So yeah, we need engineers, we need programmers, we need all all those. Uh, kind of researchers or like uh, students. Is all this ag tech and PA going to drive agriculture in the next 5, 10 and 25 years? <laughs> <laughs> okay. There was a... Yeah. I have no idea. Uh, um, I think... I think, to, I think that the, the kind of technology that we're using uh, it's basically re re revolutionizing agriculture. Uh, the detractors um, the are driving themselves. Like that's the old technology by now. It's not a new thing. And uh, I think we need. Uh, it'll be sometimes it's a bit scary. It'll be like in the Matrix. But uh, <laughs> uh, I think we're automating. We're automating everything. There are a lot of opportunities in using the information that we have. And uh, I think we have so much to, so much more to, to produce, like to, there's so much potential in this, uh, in this thing. Agriculture can be highly benefit from all the tools that we have, but we need a deeper understanding of, of the tools that we're using. It's like we're babies with a machine gun. It's like, yeah, <laughs> it's it's a bit scary sometimes. But uh, yeah, in twenty more years, I can see cleaner energies. I can see, um, well, maybe in hundred more years, I can see like agriculture outside the earth. But oh, I don't know. Uh, but I can. I, I think we have the tools. I'll hold you that one too. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have the tools for for creating cleaner, cleaner, a cleaner and more sustainable way of uh, of doing agriculture that we don't have now. We certainly don't. Uh, a deeper understanding of all the processes uh, in in agricultural work will give those answers. And uh, yeah, I think the potential is there. We can create. Uh, um, a more profitable, more sustainable agriculture in future.